And now it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Amina Pilgrim. Uh, Professor Pilgrim is Assistant Professor in Africana Studies and African American History at UMass Boston. Um, her research focuses on the African diaspora, uh, Cape Verdean studies, youth empowerment via hip hop, immigrant communities, and gender studies. She's the founder of the Hip Hop Initiative, which uses hip hop to increase critical media literacy. She's also uh, very involved in oral history projects. He, uh, she earned her bachelor's degree at Duke University and her PhD in history at Rutgers University. Uh, you know, many awards and honors uh, and uh, publications. Uh, we're really honored to have her with us. Uh, please welcome, if you will, Professor Amina Pilgrim. I should also add she's a mother of a three-year-old son, Akina. So you want to be sure to say that, right? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to begin by thanking you, Mr. President, Vice President, and Ms. Pont for the invitation to be here and for making it possible uh, for me to be here. I'm honored and humbled at this opportunity to address the life and legacy of one of the most influential people in my own life, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I would also like to pause and ask us to have a brief moment of silence to reflect on his martyrdom and also to reflect on all those people in the world who are suffering right now from the various plagues that we see around us, whether it's the volcano eruption in Cape Verde, the terrorism in Nigeria or France, or the terrorism right here, with all those affected by police brutality. So let's have a moment of silence. Thank you. The title of my talk today is Kindness and Compassion, The Final Frontier. Are there any science fiction fans here besides me? OK, well, as Mr. President mentioned, I do have a son. He's actually four now. And he and I share that interest in science fiction. and. We talk a lot about aliens and robots and things. And so as I prepared for this talk, I thought a lot about my son and his future. And I thought about science fiction because as I was preparing, he was playing with the greeting card that we have, which has Yoda on it. Anybody know Yoda? And when he opened the card, it says, you must unlearn what you have learned. I'm sorry I can't do a Yoda impersonation, but you'll see why that's relevant as I go on. I was asked to speak about three themes. One, unity. Two, how to have an honest dialogue about race. And three, the comment that Dr. King made that riots are the voice of the unheard. So in my talk, I will attempt to cover all three. And I'll also present some takeaways that I hope we all will leave with today as homework. Challenges on how we can keep Dr. Legacy's, uh, uh, Dr. King's legacy alive, excuse me. But I'll start by explaining how legacy works through my own experience. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my path to today and how I met Dr. King, so to speak, through his words, obviously. See, about 10 or 15 years ago, I might not have accepted the invitation to come here. I'm not talking about Bristol Community College, but I'm talking about this area. This area holds a lot of painful memories for me. I went to elementary school at St. Joseph's in Fairhaven, 
and I graduated from Bishop Sang High School. Perhaps some of you in this room have connections to either of those schools. But at both of those schools, I was what we would now call bullied. And I experienced traumatic racism. We don't always think of racism amongst school children as a form of bullying, but that's essentially what it was. I was the only Cape Verdean, I'm also Caribbean, or black girl in my grade from fourth grade almost until high school graduation, with the exception of a few other brown or black faces I was isolated. I was ostracized, I was taunted, and I was made to feel inferior, sometimes by teachers who would say things to me like, how did you get that score on that test? Or how did you do so well on that paper? Your people don't do so well on papers. Needless to say, it hurt. I later learned that the reactions to me were learned. As we know, children learn to fear others. And our society unfairly teaches us to fear certain groups or things. We must unlearn what we have learned. This was one of the most painful chapters of my life. But my mom, who's one of my personal heroes as well, would often quote the Bible and say, forgive them because they know not what they do. But it was during that time that my father introduced me to Dr. King. He sat me down and he told me about the civil rights movement and he made me watch documentaries like Eyes on the Prize. It gave me comfort and I truly connected with the idea that these ordinary people did extraordinary things. And this morning at my table, I had the privilege to meet one of those people, Christine Sears, who was at Selma. And it's an honor to meet you. Can we give her a round of applause? So this is how I met, so to speak, Dr. King and first heard his words. And his words gave me just enough hope to go on. Over the years, I've reflected on one of his great quotes, that you don't have to be great to serve. You don't have to make a subject and a verb agree to serve. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree or a doctorate to serve. Everyone can be great. And so I decided that I wanted to be great. I became but I became so full of hate and bitterness during the painful times that I eventually left Massachusetts and went south for college. That's where, for the first time, I studied African American history. I discovered my own Cape Verdean history through the work of Amilcar Cabral. And I met actual civil rights icons like Rosa Parks, Joseph Lowry, the late Maya Angelou, and Merle Evers. I was extremely blessed. And for the first time, I understood a direct connection between those icons and somebody like me. And I'm only sharing that because I want everyone in the room, especially the young children, to understand that this history is so close to you. All you have to do is reach out and touch it. For example, speaking to someone like Ms. Sears, like Shelley Correa, who have made history or who are making history right now. And those of you that won awards today, you are the ones we have been waiting for, in the words of poet Pearl Klee. As I said, I matured in my understanding while I was in the South. And I became to understand the spiritual core of the civil rights struggle. I also developed meaningful interracial friendships with my peers and mentors. Their kindness and compassion 
in contrast to my painful childhood experiences, helped change my attitudes about everything. And I realized that as most of the great teachers and leaders like Dr. King have, have showed us, racism hurts everyone. And we all miss out on each other when we engage in prejudice or in fear. Many of Dr. King's teachings began to be guiding principles for me and still inform my teaching and my work today. For example, Dr. King said, I decided to stick with love. And in the speech in which he said riots are the voice of the unheard, a speech he gave three weeks before his assassination in Detroit, Michigan, he said, the time is always right to do what is right. I grew up Catholic with strong values. I would assume many of us in this room share that commonality. And so those words resonated with me, and I couldn't hold on to the hate. This is Dr. King's greatest legacy. He loved us. He loved this country and all of its people so much that he gave its life for it to be better for us to be sitting here together in this room like we are now. His career began, began at age 15 when he went to college, you could say. He became the youngest Nobel Peace Prize recipient. And in that speech, he said, civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. He recognized that as a country, America had not lived up to its ideals. And today's protests are urging us to recognize that the, this work is not done. If we take seriously Dr. King's comments in his Gross Point speech called The Other America, that riots are the voice of the unheard, he said we have to think about what has been, hasn't been heard. He asked us to think about the country and what we have left to do. And so I asked us to think about what each of us can do. In order to really engage, however, I'd ask everyone to consider that we need to see with new eyes, listen with new ears, and feel with a new level of compassion. Speak to one another from a new place of love and kindness. We must understand what Dr. King said, that we are all tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. He was asking us to remember what one of the members of Music One said moments ago, that we're human first, rather than to hold on to the fictions of race that divide us, because they are fictions. Indeed, we're all connected. Dr. King's speech, again, addressed exactly what I was charged with speaking with today. And so when we think about how to have an, an honest dialogue on race, we need only to look at his words. How do we promote unity? These are not easy questions, like the question the mayor asked us. It's not an easy one. And perhaps it's important to recognize that King himself was attacked for some of his ideas on how we could solve these questions in his own time. He had become more of an internationalist towards the end of his life, and he reframed the problem of racism as a human rights issue, but at that time, that wasn't a popular concept. Fast forward to today, maybe that's something that we can pick up and people might be able to grasp it more easily. He also was very concerned about economic injustice. His message was twofold. To have the dialogue on race, we need to tell the truth, and we need to examine the true history of the country. To have unity, we need to recognize that what affects one affects us all. He said, injustice anywhere, I'm sure many of you know the quote, is a threat to justice everywhere. Today, protesters feel that they are in a war, much like the Vietnam War that Dr. King spoke out against. 
but this war is local. This is a war to end police brutality, to end the school to prison pipeline, and other issues, to solve the problem of hunger. Many of them are using hashtag reclaim MLK because he was radically courageous in addressing these truths that even today many people aren't ready to accept, but this is necessary. So we have to challenge ourselves, again, to be open to seeing with new eyes. And I come back to Yoda and learn what we have learned. Old and young and all ethnicities living here must be open to learning from one another. Again, I want to commend Shelley Correa, Ms. Sears, and all the young award winners, because this is what legacy is in action. We stand on the shoulders of so many great people. Those of us in the room of Cape Verdean descent, we stand on the shoulders of people like Dr. Bruce Rose, who's here, Fairhaven, Salah Mateos, Wareham's Rudy Santos, Harwich's Eugenia Forts, called the Cape Verdean Rosa Parks. If you don't know these names, I would encourage you to learn them. We stand on the shoulders of many so-called white allies who supported the movement, and Asian allies as well, and allies of every ethnicity who believed in the cause of human rights. So I would pause and say that these trailblazers had what Dr. King called a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. For me, that fire means different things. Oftentimes, when people talk about race and racism, it's very uncomfortable. Those words are buzzwords. They make people uncomfortable. But when you think about the struggle against racism, it's essentially a struggle for basic treatment of one another with respect and kindness and dignity. And so this is why I titled the talk kindness and compassion, the final frontier. The fire of compassion, the spirit of love, manifests in small acts of kindness between us, combined with massive direct action, like Dr. King said, could make a huge difference. He said, every person of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his or her convictions, but we must all protest whether you identify with Black Lives Matter, or Je Suis Charlie, or the Fogo volcano victims, or the kidnapped Nigerian girls, or food security, whatever it, issue it is, whatever issue it is that's important to you, we are all connected, and we have to unite to make this place better. In closing, I just want to reiterate what I hope we can all take away and put into action after we leave this morning. Let's remember that small acts of kindness and service can contribute to the global shift that we're seeking. Let's try to move beyond fear of what's different and through compassion get to know one another all over again and make community. Let's listen again with new ears Let's learn our true history, and let's work together, and remember that we're all connected. The late, great Dr. Maya Angelou said, if a human being dreams a great dream, dares to love somebody, if a human being dares to be Martin King, if a human being dares to be bigger than the condition into which she or he was born, it means so can you, and you can stretch stretch, stretch yourself so you can internalize the idea. I am a human being, therefore nothing human can be alien to me. What our country and world faces now are crises of humanity, but if we simply reduce our challenges to small tasks and step into the frontier, that kindness and compassion would afford us, 
we can be more human and we can truly make a difference. Thank you.